These days, you can track your steps and heart rate through your phone or a fitness watch. Now, through brain monitoring headsets, you can also track your cognitive performance and emotions. I talked to one of the tech entrepreneurs leading this field, Tan Lee, co-founder of Emotive. Emotive's headsets use electroencephalography, or EEG, to allow users to track their brain data. Their technology even lets you control virtual and physical objects through mental commands. In many respects, it ended up... I spoke with Lee in San Francisco, the where the company is based. False starts. When I started to read about the human brain and the efforts that have been made to understand how the brain works, the technology that allows us to advance our own understanding of the brain, it felt so constrained, so confined and so restricted um, in so many ways. And we could talk about all the ways in which it was confining, but that for me felt like a massive opportunity to really sh reshape how, when, where, why we even study the brain in the first place, because then it, I hoped it would open up a world of possibilities in how we would be able to start to unpack this amazing organ that really is so complex, so sophisticated, that is really the seat of the self. The Motive headset has electrodes that are placed on the scalp with a little saline solution. The device converts signals from the brain into digital data that can be seen in real time on a screen. Can you see the dots on the screen there? I can see them. And so as we get the signals to connect, you'll see they start to, them, oh, them all starting to go green, yeah. which just means that I have good connectivity. So I'm afraid you're gonna find that nothing up there. Oh no, we won't find that, that's for sure. Now you can start to see, if you kind of um, close your eyes you'll start and blink, you'll start to see the, the signal associated with a, a blink. Oh, wow. But that's really fascinating. Or if you clench your teeth, you'll start to see that there's a lot of noise. So typically that's noise that's superimposed onto the, the brain signal, but you can see it, right? You can see wow. that this is an electrical signal. So when your neurons in your brain fire, there's a chemical reaction that takes place that emits an electrical impulse, which we can measure just completely non-invasively from the surface of the head, we can start to see the regions of the brain that's active in specific tasks. And we've done this with, for example, athletes um, who are playing really elite sport to see what happens when their brain is under stress. What's really interesting is when you've got a brain that's very, very well trained, it's super quiet. So for example, doing interviews is very comfortable for you. So if it was my brain, for example, you might see a lot more firing, but all of these cameras do nothing for you. And so your brain is very chill, even though you've got cameras all around, because this is something that's very comfortable for you. Another aspect of the brain-computer interface built into Emotive's technology is the ability to control an object with a mind alone. This one, you're actually gonna try and move a cube a virtual cube using your mind. Okay. So what you want to imagine is that the cube is heavy and you're trying to pull it towards you. Okay. Okay. That's you trying to pull. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good, Mike. That's really good. <laughs> That's really good. But just even this exercise that we just did just shows how your the elasticity of your brain that you can train it yes at any almost any age at any age any age you can train it and you can and and the thing is the the great thing about something like this is even for rehabilitation imagine somebody who has lost a limb one of the biggest challenges is being able to actually see the feedback of moving your limb again right? if you can actually get the feedback mechanism of thinking of lifting an arm and it actually lifts for you it will help you retrain and hold, maintain that muscle before your prosthetic limb comes, for example. So it's nice to be able to actually maintain the action. Let me start, if you don't mind, with your personal story, a story that begins really about an escape, really. Yes. Yes. Escape out of Vietnam when I was four years old. 
And my mother had tried very hard to arrange this, what she thought was going to be the perfect escape. And in many respects, it ended up being the perfect escape, even though we had many, many false starts. Um, We made it out. Uh, We were very fortunate. So after five days um, and nights at sea, we were rescued by a British um, oil tanker just off the coast of Malaysia and taken into a refugee camp, which ended that ordeal um, and allowed us to start over in a, ultimately in Australia after living in the refugee camp for about three months. We were lucky um, to be accepted into Australia. How do you think that journey and all of the things that you've gone through helped to kind of propel you to where you are today? I think it has shaped me so profoundly. And when people say, oh, you work in the brain, when did your interest in the brain start? You know, my interest in the brain started when I was a very, very young child and just observing my mother and her own definition of her world. Um, And then also watching my sister and I shape our own sense of reality as well. We, We had the exact same environment, but both of us perceived our realities very differently. And then as I, as a young woman, as I worked in community service, I saw many people shaped by the way that they saw their world. So, you know, the way we experience the world around us is really shaped by the model that our brain forms of the world, Um, not necessarily the exact situation that we experience. You know, there's no objective (laughs) A reality. It's a subjective reality based on our brain's model of the world. Um, and so I was really deeply fascinated by this system that defines our experience of the world. It defines who we are. It shapes our perceptions um, and memories and experience of everything around us. There is just an, an immense amount of information that we don't know and so many possibilities on how we could take this technology. Neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to rewire in response to learning and experiences. Stress, diet, and relationships are just a few important factors that can affect how our brains are wired. Tan says that by better understanding our brains, we can work more efficiently, heal faster, and fundamentally live out more fulfilling lives. Yeah, it's the golden age of the brain in a sense. I mean, to be there and be a pioneer, it's, it has to be exciting. But one of the things that you talked about uh, was perception. And, and I've always said perception is reality. If you think you're going to go in and nail this interview and get this job and you go in with that attitude and you really believe it, it's just, in a sense programming our own mind. Yes. And I've heard you in your other TED Talk talking about that, that these negative thoughts like crop up and how they kind of accelerate that you can do the opposite. And and that's one facet of this that I think is really fascinating. Yes. Can you talk about that for our viewers? Yeah. So for the longest time, so many neuroscientists thought that the brain's wiring was fixed. Right? Once you, it's wired, you can't change it anymore. And so if you had trauma from injury or stroke, you're stuck with whatever brain um, trauma happened. But the reality is, uh, and we found this out in the last two decades or so when I started to to research about this brain, one of the books that I read um, just got me so inspired and so excited was the fact that the brain is plastic, right? It has neuroplasticity, which means that it's able to continually rewire and reprogram itself. And in fact, if we can study how it does that, then we have an opportunity to potentially enhance how we learn and make that process more efficient. And I think that provides us with a really big opportunity space for adults because as we live much longer lives and as the world around us continues to evolve and to change and to modernize at breakneck speeds, we need as humans to cope with that environment. And in fact, genetics changes way too slowly, right? We can't wait for human evolution to happen through genetic changes, the human brain is our modern man's response to that because it is the system that allows us to continually adapt to modernization. And so this is how we, our brain continues to change. Um, 
and modify itself. And so if we can use technology to help us instrument and understand how the brain is changing in response to the changes in our environment, we can start to choose activities that can be more optimal to help us learn, to help us rest, to help us restore and replenish the attentional networks in our brain um, so that we can help the brain stay more resilient throughout life. We believe the future ahead is bright and that the best way to predict this future is to invent it. One day, Lee says, understanding your own brain activity could be as normal as knowing your heart rate or your daily step count. You talk about, I, I can measure my steps here with my wristwatch, Apple watch, which, yes. you know, 10 years ago, that's not possible. Yes. But you can you can see a day when we can measure our brain in much the same way, can't Absolutely. You? And we've done, as a human spe uh, race, done an incredible job with cardiovascular health. You know, two decades ago, it was a challenge, right? M many people um, struggled with cardiovascular health and people would pass away from that. But I think that this is the next frontier. If we can actually do what we've done for cardiovascular health for the human brain by actually measuring, understanding it, and then changing our activities in response to a better, deeper understanding of our brains, then we have a much better chance of extending our brain's resilience well into hopefully our 90s, 100s, because it looks like we are going to live much longer lives. Maybe, you know, some of that, will, I will be some of the, the beneficiary of some of that, but definitely my daughter, who's only four now, will be living a much longer life. Um, and so I hope that what we're doing for her um, will help us understand brain health in a way that will help her extend her brain's resilience well into her 90s and hopefully 100s. So I know you wear the headset. Yes. Um, how has it changed your life, would you say? I think what's best for me from wearing the device um, regularly is just an insight into my brain. I'm getting more and more information about how my brain works every day. And for the first time, I feel like I know the kinds of things that's, I feel much more empowered to know more about my daily activities and I'm starting to change my what I do just in response to them. So some things I can't change, right? There are days when I have back-to-back -back meetings and I know that's going to be a funky day, <laughs> fine. But I know that on the weekends, there are activities that I will kind of stave off doing or avoid doing because I know that my brain's had too much fatigue and it really needs some downtime. And so that's what, th there are little changes that I've met, I've been making to the choices that I make um, around activities that I participate in or exercises that I do that help to just help keep my brain healthier. For people living with disabilities, the potential for brain-machine interface technology can be life-changing. In 2017, quadriplegic Rodrigo Hubner Mendez became the first person to drive a Formula One race car with his mind. The car, which didn't have a steering wheel, was built on a motor's technology. There's, in your TED Talk, a description of a young man who dreams of being a race car driver, and it's a dream where it's a hope, but it's never going to be realized. Yes. And yet it is. Um, and it's amazing and amazingly powerful. Can you describe that? And what was the feeling when you saw this actually taking place? Oh, it was unbelievable for me too. So Rodrigo Huber Mendes was the victim of a carjacking incident in Brazil when he was only 18 years old. So he was shot in the neck and it left him paralyzed from the neck down. And for about over 30 years, Rodrigo was not able to really move, uh, get back in the car um, at all, let alone drive a Formula One car. You know, when I started Emotive, my dream was to create technology that would be able to be used by 100% of the world's population. And we wanted technology that was non-invasive, that would give the freedom to the user to wear it when they chose to, but take it off when they didn't want to wear it anymore so that they had full agency over how they would use this technology. And to have now someone wear this technology to drive a race car around a racetrack um, using his mind was just so overwhelmingly powerful for me. 
and it really illustrates uh, the potential. I mean, it's it's just whatever you can imagine. I I, I think in some respects, correct? Yes, I mean, yes. I think the future is really um, incredible in terms of what this technology can can afford all of us. Amazing. Thank you so much. What a great conversation. Thank you, Mike.